I'd like for you to turn tonight to 1 John 2. And I'd like to continue the theme, our studies we started last week, concerning discerning the will of God. Now last time, you remember, we dealt with learning to cope for yourself. Tonight I want to deal with discernment and to deal especially with some of the wrong methods of discerning the will of God, getting guidance and so forth, some of the wrong methods. Now I trust you in 1 John 2, but I want to mention first of all 1 Corinthians 12 because there we have among the gifts of the Spirit one gift called discernings of spirits. Now not every charismatic Christian will have that particular gift But every spirit-filled Christian can discern between truth and error. We'll see this in 1 John chapter 2. In verse 20, he says, For you have an anointing from the Holy One, that is the Holy Spirit, and you know all things. Now, if you know all things, why would you need to ask anyone? Well, you say, I didn't know I knew all things. Well, he says in verse 27, But the anointing which you have received of him abides in you. Now, he's talking about the baptism of the Holy Spirit. The anointing which you've received from Christ abides in you, and you need not that any man teach you. But the same anointing teaches you of all things, and is truth and is no lie. Now, the anointing he speaks of here is the Holy Spirit within. 1 John 2.20 and verse 27 speaks of this same anointing. The anointing is the Holy Spirit within. And he says that the Holy Spirit will teach you all things pertaining to truth. And of course, the will of God is truth. And so whatever you need to know about the will of God or some decision or whatever, he says the Holy Spirit will teach you. That you don't need to ask anyone else. You don't need to ask any man. That he will teach you truth from error. Right and wrong. The will of God. If you let that anointing that's already in you as a spirit-filled Christian, the Holy Spirit guide you and teach you. Now, when he says here that because you have this anointing, you don't need that any man should teach you, the same Bible, remember, says God set teachers in the church. In fact, the Apostle John, even while he's saying you have an anointing and no man should teach you, he gives us five chapters of teaching himself. About many things. He says, here's how you can know a lot of things. So he's a teacher. So the plain meaning is when he says you have the anointing, the baptism of the Holy Spirit, and you have no need that any man teach you. And yet he goes right on teaching. And we know teachers are in the church. Then the plain meaning is that God didn't set teachers in the church to give you guidance. Because you have the anointing that he has. God didn't set the teacher in the church to be a religious counselor. The only counselor I know anything about in the Word of God is the Lord Jesus Christ. He's called that in Isaiah. He's the only one in the world called the counselor. So God didn't set the teacher in the church to give you guidance that only the Holy Spirit can give. To be a religious counselor. But since He said you have an anointing and don't need to be taught... And God set the teacher in the church. You have to find out what the teacher's function is. And so the teacher's function is what it ought to be obvious as, and most people seem to miss it, or many do. The teacher's been set in the church to teach you the Word of God. That's all he's called to do. There's only one counselor, and he's in you. He's been set in the church to teach you God's Word, not teach you Sunday school or teach you about politics or government or anything else, but to teach you the Word of God. Not even teach you religion, but teach you the Word of God. Why? Because the Word of God will be the basis upon which the Holy Spirit within the anointing will teach you and guide you so that when you hear something, a voice inside or even outside, you'll know if it's right or not because you know the Word of God, because the teacher taught you that was what his anointing was for to teach you. You have the same anointing, and when you learn what he knows, then you don't need anyone to teach you anything. And that's why he labors, as we labor, in the Word and doctrine to teach you. So that once you learn a thing, you don't ever have to ask about it again. 
You see, the message on discerning the will of God, how to know the will of God, how to cope with your life yourself, is as much the faith message as the strongest faith message we've ever preached. Because only those who are walking by faith can cope for themselves. Only those who are willing to walk by faith are willing to lean on the Holy Spirit and the Word of God and not man. Not the best of men. Now, until you learn what the Holy Spirit has taught the teacher, there may be some areas where you occasionally would have to ask a question. And, of course, I guess we've answered several thousand questions during our ministry and we don't get offended over a question. But when people who've been taught a certain thing and sat under an area of teaching for months and years then ask a question about it, they're asking the teacher to use his anointing to do for them what only the Holy Spirit can. Well... Some of you, I'm probably talking more to than others, but I'm talking to all of us. The tendency to want advice that we can hear and get, you know, prepackaged right now is quite with us in every church. There are very few people in the final analysis, no matter how severe the trial, who will just settle down and say, I have the Word of God. I've been taught the Word of God. I know the Word of God. I have the Holy Spirit within The Word of God says, I don't need any man to teach me. Not what I already know. If you don't know, baptism in the New Testament is always described as baptism into the name of Jesus. Although you could read that for yourself. You may need to be taught. But really, you don't have to be taught that. You don't have to be taught sun shining. Just go out and look. If healing is taught in the Word, you don't have to ask anyone, is it for today? You just have to ask yourself, am I willing to believe it? There's an anointing you have. Now, you may need some help if you don't have the baptism. That's the anointing. Because speaking in tongues is pretty far out into left field and orbit for a person that's non-charismatic. But when you receive the baptism, no one has to teach you that speaking in tongues is all right today. You just go ahead and do it. We don't have to come along and say, no, it's all right to speak in tongues. Our divine healing, these things come along with the blessing of the baptism. You have no need that any man should teach you. Now, how to apply the truths of divine healing, what the purpose of speaking in tongues would be. Now, here's where the teacher's gift comes in. He shows you how to appropriate what you've received. Like we have a book on why speak in tongues, and we give you three reasons why you should. And these are three ministries in the Spirit. To yourself, to others, to God. You minister to God in the Spirit. You speak mysteries to Him. Paul spent a lot of time speaking mysteries to God. People try to say that he said the tongues are the least gift. He didn't say that. He said, I wish you all spake in tongues. He said, I speak in tongues more than you all. But he says, in the church, I speak with my understanding so you can understand. But when I want to worship God, I just pray in the Spirit. More than all of you, Corinthians. And they were speaking in tongues so much, he wrote an epistle dealing with it. And he does some teaching in 1 Corinthians 12 to 14. John does considerable teaching, and yet he says, you have an anointing and no man needs to teach you. So he's not going to contradict what he spends in the same epistle considerable time doing, teaching us. But what he's saying is that the teacher has been set in the church, what the New Testament says, to teach you the Word of God, which becomes the basis For the Holy Spirit giving you personal guidance. The Holy Spirit wants to guide you. He wants to speak to you. He wants to direct and influence you. That's why He's there. Not just so you can speak in tongues and work miracles. You would need Him for that, to be sure. But that's the result of Him being there. The purpose is to guide you and lead you down that pathway 100% in the will of God. To get you to the place where, you know, you've died out to self and you find yourself every time you open your eyes... Not before the cross, hanging on it. You know, you've got a cross. Jesus spent considerable time teaching us about our cross that we had to take up and bear with him. In spite of the fact, though, that every spirit-filled, charismatic believer has the same anointing as the teacher who teaches them, many people depreciate their anointing and will seek guidance in other ways. We mentioned some of those other ways last week. Everything from seeking it through prophecy, vision, dream, to playing Bible roulette. And in between is that counselor they're always looking for. Sometimes he's a pastor, teacher, or just a friend. Anybody, so I don't have to think or seek God for myself. Ephesians 4.30 says you can grieve the Holy Spirit. 
Now, charismatic Christian, are you aware? Have you ever thought that you're grieving the Holy Spirit when you ask Him to anoint you to speak in tongues, to prophesy, to preach, to teach, to get out there and witness, and then you ignore Him when He tries to speak to you inwardly? i got to run to Brother Freeman or pray for a vision or a dream. That grieves Him. When you ignore Him, and yet, come on, Holy Spirit, anoint me. I want to prophesy tonight or whatever. Or I don't want this message to fall flat, so anoint me so I can teach it. Or when I'm witnessing to my husband or mother or whoever, you expect that anointing. You've got the Holy Spirit. And then when He tries to direct you to do this or not do that, or maybe not even go to witness to that person at this time or go somewhere else, you ignore Him. Well, what should I do? You know, I've got this strange leading. I feel like I ought to get out there and witness to those people in my family. But something seems to be saying, not now. You'll just turn them off. Is that God or not? Well, why don't you learn to hear the Holy Spirit for yourself? Because, you know, somebody else is not going to be around all the time. Now, this is as much the message of faith as any message we ever preached on faith. And I don't like to sound pessimistic, but there are just some who, doesn't matter how strong you come on with learning to cope for yourself, they refuse to do that. And they run around to all of the ministries here. If they see after they've dealt with me two or three times and I just keep giving them the word, then they'll run to Brother Hill, now Brother Farrell, people that I've dealt with maybe 20, 30 times. When you say, from this point on, you're going to have to heed those things we're teaching. We just can't have you sitting out there and not believing the word that we're preaching. And not listening to what we're teaching and saying. And then, you know what they do? They start running somebody else in the body. If anyone ever comes to you and they've told you, I've been dealing with them and I won't any longer talk to them about that problem. Now, surely I wouldn't have to tell you, you shouldn't be trying to counsel them. You just make my job harder if you do that. I mean, it's good sometimes when you just begin a ministry or you're fairly new in it to have people come and ask your advice. I remember a fellow, oh, years ago, back in 1966 or 7, when we first received the Holy Spirit. He was a deliverance minister, and somebody called him at 3 o'clock in the morning to pray for somebody's deliverance over the telephone. He said, I just don't think I've got the faith for it at 3 o'clock, and hung up. Now, see, right away, we didn't get much good reaction from that. Because I doubt if a lot of you understood why he said that. He said, I just don't believe I have the faith for it. He went on to say, why don't you pray for them yourself? And hung up. You see, I just received the Holy Spirit. And I thought, well, I guess I would have talked to them. That would be quite an honor to have somebody call you and think that you could pray a prayer of faith and deliver them. But you're not long in the charismatic ministry till you find out a few things. And when people are sitting there with the baptism of the Holy Spirit calling for someone else to pray for somebody that's sitting before them, it really doesn't make a lot of sense because you have the same anointing. I still occasionally have somebody bring someone up here to get the baptism of the Holy Spirit. She wants the baptism or he. My first question always, well, why didn't you pray for them? That's what we do here at Faith Assembly. Really, that is what we do. But anyway... Sure, he could have had faith for it. That wasn't his point. If you don't understand that, you don't have a ministry. That's why you don't understand it. If you've got a ministry, you'll find out that that just isn't necessarily the way you do things. To get back to what we were saying, many, if not most, charismatics who have the same anointing don't want to use their anointing. And they're grieving the Holy Spirit by it. You'll have people stand up and say, Thus saith the Lord. Or the Spirit of the Lord shows me thus and so, and they begin to share with us what the Spirit of God is saying to them and through them, and expect us to take them seriously and heed what they're saying. And some of the same people are the first in line to get counseling and advice from some men for themselves. My advice is, if you're one of those, why don't you... Use some of that anointing you said you had when you were giving us all of that great wisdom from heaven that we needed to heed and ask the Holy Spirit to anoint you with some of that wisdom so that you will know what to do about your marriage problem yourself. You see, it's faith or you'll remain a baby if you just have to keep asking, what do I do? Why don't you ask the Holy Spirit? And I know a lot of you have prophesied, spoken in tongues, interpreted 
The Lord has shown me this vision, and then some of you will be up here asking for counseling and advice. But you wanted us to heed that advice you were getting by the Spirit. Why don't you use that anointing to get some of that wisdom for yourself? Then you'll know how to go through that financial trial without, you know, jumping off the ten-story building. You'll know how to discern whether or not that doctrine is true or not. Now, if you ask a teacher, now, a lot of people call themselves teachers that are not. But if you ask a teacher who has the anointing for guidance, he will use his anointing to tell you to heed what he's been teaching you from the Word. That's how he'll use his anointing. He won't give you the guidance. You see, if he's anointed by the Holy Spirit, he's going to use his anointing to tell you to use your anointing. Because that's what he's called to do. He's not going to give you guidance and advice that only the Holy Spirit can give. Sometimes people say, I advise them to do this or that about marriage. I never advise them to do anything about marriage. Never. And in spite of the fact that I never tell a person, even if they have biblical grounds for divorce, which the only one in the Bible is fornication, I never have ever said it's okay to remarry. I just say the Bible's silent. That's where I leave it. That's a decision between you and the Lord. If you had biblical grounds, and yet I have people saying, I got one woman now, their children are telling me that I said it's okay for her to marry somebody. Well, how could that be what I said when I never say those things to anybody? So, what I'm saying is, if you ask a teacher for guidance, well, anyone in ministry who will have the anointing of the Holy Spirit, if God set him in it, he will use his anointing to tell you to use your anointing, tell you to do your homework, which is to heed what he's teaching you from the Word of God, because whatever the Spirit shows you will be based on the Word of God. And as we said last week, what if he gave you some advice or counsel or guidance How would you know it's from heaven or right if you don't know the Word of God so you can line up what He's telling you with the Word of God? See, it brings us right back to why we stress the Word of God here. Over and over and over and over, we stress the importance of the Word. That you've got to heed what we teach under the anointing, and you have to study for yourself. And let's be honest, there are people sitting right there in the chairs now. And we include everybody in the building, wherever they're at. They're just people who do not study the Word of God, who do not heed the Word of God until they're in a problem and a real trial and then call you or want to come and spend a half a day, what should I do, sort of questions. And if the teacher is anointed, he's going to use his anointing to tell you to use your anointing. But Christians who neglect the Word and bypass the Holy Spirit, they grieve him and he's not going to tell them anything. First of all, because he can't, they don't know the word, and they wouldn't know if that voice is God or not. He's going to waste his time when you'd have to question and go get counseling about whether or not what you're getting inside that you think may be the Holy Spirit is the Holy Spirit. I have people ask this all the time. Is this God? How do I know if it's God? Unless he gives me a vision or revelation. Unless he shows me some way. I appreciate people saying the Holy Spirit seems to be leading me somewhere to do this or that, and if it lines up with the Word of God, fine. But if they ask me, what do you think? What do you feel? I don't feel anything. (laughs) I'm a teacher. All I know is the Word of God. That's why you keep getting it up here when you come for your advice and guidance. It may sound a little monotonous, The Word of God really can't get monotonous, but it may sound monotonous to people who thought they were going to get a special revelation. I just say, let's ask the Holy Spirit for wisdom. You've got the anointing, I've got the anointing. James 1. Any man lack wisdom? Let him ask. So a person who doesn't spend time in the Word, who doesn't do his homework, who neglects the leading of the Holy Spirit within, is like in amateur radio, the novice. There are a lot of degrees of licenses. The novice is the lowest. I don't mean that in a demeaning way. It just happens to be that they can't copy but five words a minute in code. (laughs) I have to laugh because it's almost unbelievable that anybody can copy code at five words a minute. I'd go to sleep. (laughs) But I can remember when that sounded awfully fast. But anyway, it's like a novice who gets off into where we extra classes are, which run 20, 
through, say, 30 words a minute. I cruise about 25. And it'd be like a novice getting off of his segment of his band. He's only allowed a certain place. And getting over there into high-speed code. And generally, there are three or four signals just right on top of one another. And he can't discern which signal he wants to copy, and he couldn't anyway because it's too fast. And so he's going to have to get someone else, you know, to interpret that for him is what I'm saying. Now, my point is that sometimes my wife has asked me when she hears all of those signals just on top of one another. Now, code's just dot and dashes. It's really dits and daws, but most people learn dots and dashes to describe it. And it's not like words. You could pick out one language over another, but it's all the same language. And just on top of one another, two, three, four signals. And she'll see me just writing it down at high speed. She'll say, how can you tell which one you want? Well, I said in effect to her, I've done my homework. I've spent the time learning code. Hundreds of hours. Now, not hundreds of hours of your time or God's time, but the time you were fishing, chasing a little white ball around. <laughs> knitting or talking, just talking about nothing. A lot of people like just talk. Well, that's your business. That's your hobby. Go ahead. <laughs> but I spent hundreds and hundreds of hours going from five words a minute to 25 words a minute. In fact, I've got a certificate for 30 words a minute. Praise the Lord. And that's a miracle in itself, I'll tell you another time. But you can't even write that fast. But I did. And anyway, she says, how can you pick out the signal you want? I said, I've trained my ear to discern. I can hear three, four signals, and they're all just dit dal dit dal and real fast, machine gun fast. I just pick out the one I want because I've done my homework. Now, if a novice at five words a minute got off into all of that mess, and it just sounds like a mess to the untrained ear, High-speed code. He has to get someone to interpret. That's what happens, dear friends, when you don't do your homework. You can't discern which signal is right. You're hearing all of these voices. Now, which one of them is the Lord? You've got to do your homework. And if a teacher is going to use his anointing to help you, he's going to tell you to use your anointing. Now, that presupposes, as we've been stressing, you're studying the Word of God along with Him. You're heeding what He's teaching you. You're doing independent study so that when you hear these various voices, you know which one's the Lord. Well, let's come tonight to some of the wrong methods of seeking how to discern the voice of the Spirit. How to know the will of God in some matter. Now, at the outset, let me point out, before we look at some of the methods, that the reason... Some cannot discern the voice of the Spirit, discern God's will in a matter. It's because we said there are many voices within and without seeking to influence you. And you've not trained yourself, you see, to pick out the one that's right, like we do in high-speed code. But basically, it's because you've never learned how to discern the will of God. And so we need to learn how to do this. And so because people do not know how, they either reject all the voices they're hearing and run for counseling and advice. And have you ever thought that's just another voice? Aha. Uh -huh. See there? People who can't discern which voice is right and come and ask anyone for counsel or advice, that's just another voice. How do you know it's right? Maybe the person's well-intentioned, but if you don't know the Word of God, he might say, well, go jump off a cliff. The Lord will pick you up because, do not the Scriptures say, He gives His angels charge over you and they'll keep you in all of your ways and bear you up in their hands lest you dash your foot against a stone. So they reject all voices and go seek another voice. Or they wait upon circumstances to push them in one direction or another. And when a door opens, say, that's God. Door closes, they say, that's not God. And it may be just the opposite. Maybe the devil closed the door. And it is God. And you've got to, you know, open it. Well, you've got to do some thinking. It won't do any good to stand up here week after week to teach you unless it gets down into the area of where you live, your spirit. And then people use all of the wrong methods like Bible, roulette, go by feelings, urges, hunches, or ask dear Abby, 
So the wrong methods, I want to give you the wrong methods because it helps us as much to know what not to do as it does what to do, right? We got a book on how to learn the will of God, so we don't have to cover that book. Let's give you some of the ways that people are using that you shouldn't. And first of all, the Abbey Askers is don't. Our advice is just don't. I'm being a little facetious. James 1 says, if you lack wisdom, ask God, not Abbey. We've got Abbey Askers, Feelings Followers, Hunch Hunters, Science Seekers, Circumstance Coordinators, and on and on and on. So the Abbey Askers, our counselors, don't. The next group, you see, we don't have to spend much time with that here. But people do ask Abbey, you know, some of the most personal problems. And they're Christians sometimes. Next are the Feeling Followers. Well, I felt led, quote, unquote, the feelings followers. I felt led. All feelings are notoriously unreliable. And I get this, you know, in our counseling. Well, I felt led to marry this man. I know he wasn't real spiritual, but he was religious. He was a church member and he went to church fairly regularly. And I thought, you know, he would grow and develop because I'm charismatic and now, he forbids I speak in tongues. He repudiates and opposes the baptism of the Holy Spirit. He insists that we take our children to the doctor when they're sick. Now, I felt led of the Lord to marry him. What do you feel I should do now? <laughs> well, I don't feel you should do anything. But I believe that you should stop being led by your feelings and go by the Word of God and the inward leading of the Holy Spirit. He's just waiting on you to learn how to discern His voice within. He has a way of speaking. And I'll tell you, my friends, I don't feel that I am at some place that you're not or couldn't get to. It never occurs to me that I have to ask anyone but the Lord for guidance and help. And he wants to give it to me, and he does. And it's amazing sometimes the things that he shows, just the opposite to what you might do. I think we said that last week. When Jesus said, don't take a thought when they call you before the authorities, I'll give you the words to say. You see, some of the things we might say, which would sound very logical, would be the last thing the Holy Spirit would give you. And we have to face facts, most people. I doubt if we can say a lot of people. It's probably more true to say most people don't know how to listen to the voice of the Spirit. So they've got to plan their little speech. <coughs> Reply. Their rebuttal. And as a result, they just get their foot in their mouth and sometimes end up in jail where if you let the Holy Spirit speak, you might end up in jail, but at least you have the comfort of knowing that you're in God's will. You can be in jail and not be in God's will because you opened your big mouth at the wrong time full of theological facts, but they just didn't fit that situation. Well, I felt led of the Lord. What do you feel I should do now that I'm in trouble? I don't feel a thing. I really don't. I tell people, I don't feel anything. But I believe you should stop going by your feelings because, you see, feelings are getting you into trouble. Feelings, as I said, are quite unreliable. I give an instance in the book How to Know God's Will. I believe I do. I didn't check it out, but... Where generally, when I used to travel quite a bit and we had a lot of invitations to meetings, would pray, seek the Lord about which ones to take. Some I could look at and by the inward witness of the Spirit, I'd know to go or not to go. But you see, sometimes you can be led by your emotions. And so I got one appeal and rather than really seek the Lord on it, it was just go. See, I got go. I was led by my emotions. By the way, that was several months ahead. We planned a year ahead as best we could. We would take invitations to fill up a year. The more I prayed about it, that one would stick out, don't go. Red flag, don't go, don't go. And finally, about a month before it was time to go to that meeting, and I guess they were already advertising it, I had to write them and tell them, the Lord says not to come. No reflection on you people of your church. But he says, I am not to go and I have to obey the Lord. Well, rather than them getting offended, they wrote back and said, praise the Lord for someone that listens to the Holy Spirit. But my point in reciting that to you is, 
that generally while I would pray over meetings, I let my emotions dictate. I felt led to go. And sometimes it was just the opposite. I felt led not to go. I didn't feel I wanted to go. It may be an invitation to some old dead Baptist or Methodist or Episcopal church. As those invitations came, not infrequently. I sure didn't feel like I was led to go. I was out of that. I didn't want to go back in it. But as I would pray, the Holy Spirit would say, Go. I have a purpose. Then it was no problem. Then you feel led to go. Really. But it's the Spirit. But you see, I felt led to go, and the Spirit later said, Don't go. You didn't get my mind on it. Other cases, I don't want to go. Don't feel like I want to go. The Spirit says, Go, as you pray about it. You can't go by feelings. If I go by feelings, I would miss God. You know, the feeling I have sometimes is to do it your way. You know, people who just want you to do it the easy way. Every time i got a problem, I'll call you. That's the easy way. The hard way is to just over and over point you to the Word and to the Holy Spirit. That's the Bible does. That's the hard way. Because, you see, you're coming against all of human nature... Self-pity and the whole mass of Christendom, including charismatic Christendom, that encourages you to depend on man and not God and the Word. So that's what you're coming against when you stand up here and say, trust the Lord. So feeling followers. Well, I felt impressed to quit my job and sit home and study the Word. Now we're out of food. They've turned off the water, the gas, the lights. What do you feel I should do? <laughs> he felt led to quit his job to study the Word, and I was feeling cold and hungry. <laughs> People who go by feelings often end up feeling cold and hungry. Well, I don't feel a thing, but you see, if he would have spent time in the Word before he quit his job so he could spend time in the Word, you want me to go over that again? If... Individuals like that would have spent time in the Word before they quit their job to spend time in the Word. Then they would have been able to discern between feeling and faith. Because sometimes you'll feel led to do some things that's not the Holy Spirit. It's feeling. It's emotion. It's sentimentality. Real strong wish and desire often can be counterfeited for faith. Well, I hope, and that hope will get you way out there. It's good to hope. But see, hope will leave you stranded, and faith is a bridge from God's promise to you. One time a fellow said, well, I quit my job to study and pray and wait upon a ministry to open. I thought that was strange. You quit your job to study and pray to wait for a ministry to open. Now he said, behind in rent, we're real hungry. He was real lean looking. Why is it it works for you, Brother Freeman? It doesn't work for me. Well, I said, first of all, the reason it worked for me, I never asked anybody why it wasn't working. It's that simple. Because, you see, well, why spend an hour over what's obvious? Because, you know, you go through all the details of that. I figure you can figure it out yourself. That God knows that you're going to be asking why out there six months from now. So... Why is he going to let you get away with calling it faith when it isn't? He knows what you're going to do out there. So maybe that's one of the reasons why it isn't working. But I just said it never occurred to me to ask him by why it wasn't working. Because the money didn't come by the 30th. Why, if it hadn't come by the 50th, I wouldn't ask anybody. Why isn't it working? When I was in college, I was there strictly by faith. Criticized by everybody. Everybody. The last semester, they said, you can't get into class because you don't have the money. See, I was going by faith. I always got it in time to pay them. Didn't owe them a penny. But the last semester, they changed the rules. You got to pay in advance. I didn't have the money. Do you think I got worried because the money didn't come? First day of the classes, I missed them all because they won't let you in if you don't have the money. Second day, missed all the classes. Third day, missed all the classes. Now, if you would have come over to the house, you wouldn't see me down on the floor kicking and screaming like an infant, Lord, why? Now I'm embarrassed. I'm ashamed. I've told everybody it works. Everybody says it won't work. And I've been going to school supporting a family literally on faith. 
No, if you'd have come over there, I'd just be quietly waiting on the Lord to open the way. I didn't know how he would, but I knew he would. Because, like I said to my wife, he sent me here, he'll provide. You watch, he'll open the way. Third day, head of the Bible department, I was his student assistant, graded the papers, taught when he was away. He came and said, why aren't you in class? I told him the little simple story. Didn't have the money. They wouldn't let me in this time. Before I got in by faith and then paid the bill. So you have to know it's faith because you have to pay your bills or it isn't faith. You don't go away leaving debts and call it faith. Why he said, now he said it and I just said because God says he'll honor those who trust him. That's Psalm 91. He does say that. I will honor him and set him on high. He said, a student like you, they won't let in straight A's. And it was straight A's. Oh, God, I was a high school dropout. <laughs> he said, I'll go up and sign the note myself. Now, when you can get a teacher signing notes for students, volunteering, which he did, and I was right in. And of course, you know the rest of the story. It went on through. But what I'm saying is, when it's faith, you don't have to sit around and worry or ask people why. Now, I have discovered if some who quit their jobs and go to school or whatever on faith, and that's what I did. I locked up my business and just went to school on faith because I knew the Lord. I had that inward knowing, not feeling, that I was to do that. If some, though, who do what I did and it doesn't work would have spent the time in the Word, they might have run across a passage, you know, in all of their searching, like Second Thessalonians 3 and verse 10, which says, if a man doesn't... <laughs> Pardon me for laughing. If a man doesn't work, he shouldn't eat. Well, you didn't work. Well, who said I didn't work? I did work. I did whatever I could do that didn't interfere with why God sent me there, and that was to study. Because, you see, he was going to use me to open doors. You don't need an education to preach, but he was going to use me to write books and open doors through the education that he gave me. But anyway, people say, you mean there are no exceptions to that, that if a man doesn't work, don't let him eat? Well, let's put it this way. See, if you answer that question, then I sound like a contradiction. Except I did the little things that brought in a little income, but I did close up my business, didn't seek a job. That's why I got criticized. They said, well, he won't work. He's starving his family. And literally, they were getting fat on faith. All of us were. I was 225 pounds. So, if you ask, are there no exceptions to that? Can a person quit and just study the Word and let God open a ministry? Let's not approach it that way. If God wants you to sit home and study His Word and not work 40 or 50 hours a week, which is what He said to me inside, anybody can work Hobart. Anybody can eat T-bone steaks for breakfast. You're 32 years old. There's a big gap back there you've got to make up. You dropped out of high school. I'm going to make an example of you send a high school dropout through college, never make less than an A, Go on to a doctor's degree. So I knew, you see, why I was there. Now, if you ask me how I know, that's a part of the whole message or why we have a book, How to Know God's Will. There's a way to know. It's not feeling, it's knowing. You might feel just the opposite to what you know. And so rather than say, are there any exceptions, let's put it this way. If God wants you to do that, stay home and study, rather than work 40, 50, 60 hours a week so you can drive a Cadillac or whatever... He will let you know it and provide for you. And you'll never have to ask, why isn't it working? Because it's always working. And it always worked for me. Never missed a meal. Never had a penny. Never missed a meal. Motor fall out of the car and it did. I was in a little pasture. I won't ride this bus very long. God will provide. I made my confession before I knew you were supposed to make confessions of faith. It wasn't long until there was a check in my mailbox at school for the motor. And just things like this constantly. I'm saying if God wants you to sit home and study, you will know it. You won't feel it, you will know it. Well, I feel led to quit my job and study. Time short, shouldn't I do that? No. But when you, K-N-O-W, when you know it, then you'll have the faith for it. 
and you won't have to have somebody else supporting you. Oh, God may provide through others, and He provided in so many ways. I never was ashamed to take what He provided sometimes through enemies. Yeah, through my enemies, because He felt sorry for the family or whatever. I didn't care. Faith doesn't care. David said, God will set a table before you in the midst of your enemies. And he'll cause them to put the food on there. Many times. If you don't sit down and eat, then you're despising what he's providing. He'll make even your enemies to praise you. Well, anyway, if you feel led to get into the ministry and sit home and study and not work, you better not do it. When you know that you cannot do anything else, when you know that, you will die if you don't study that word. You'll die if you don't preach it. When you know it's God, He'll provide for you. If that's the way He wants to do it. Now don't take that as an open door to run out and try it because it won't work. Because feeling followers sometimes end up feeling cold and hungry. Now, another group, another method of seeking guidance or the will of God are the hunch hunters. Now people who follow hunches and emotional urges instead of seeking the will of God through his word and through the anointing they have within the Holy Spirit who is there to lead them if they seek hunches or emotional urges you'll find that their lives are pretty unstable they're unreliable I mean this will characterize their lives because they're not settled in the word of God They can't sit still. And I'm not talking about mothers getting up with babies, but some people just can't sit still. And some of them I see going just constantly back there, not mothers with babies. And if you've got a physical problem, we'll pray for it. I'm serious. A person ought to be able to sit through a meeting. I appreciate taking screaming babies out so it won't get on the tape, so we're not talking about that. I found that instability manifests itself in those ways. And people follow hunches and urges. Like one man came to us years ago after we became charismatic for deliverance. You could take one look at him and see he needed deliverance, but he needed more than that. He needed salvation. So we led him in a confession of faith in Christ and baptism of the Holy Spirit with the evidence and then prayed for his deliverance and then in talking with him counseling with him I learned that he was living with a divorcee in a sinful state I said well you know you have to give that up because you know you've got a door open to oppression unless your life's straight and cleaned up now you're a Christian give that up well he wrestled with the decision whether or not he should give her up completely or try to get her saved uh oh Some people couldn't see a snare if it was spelled S-N-A-R-E. Watch out. They'd walk right into it. So he came one day in trouble. Now he's in trouble. He didn't follow the counsel and advice, which was based on the Word of God. You see, we do give it when there are cases that require it, like new convert. So he's in trouble. One day he said he's driving by her house several times. And here's this urge, this hunch. One day he said he's driving by her house several times. And here's this urge, this hunch. See, if you just drove by, the hunch or urge wouldn't have been there. But drove by her house one day several times. And so I had this hunch or urge to take her one of your tapes and get her saved. The next scene in that scenario, you can guess it. She's pregnant. He's in trouble. What do I do now? Well, you have a hunch you ought to tell him not to follow hunches. You just say, well, I told you so. What else can you say? Wanting me to marry them in holy wedlock. Well, it was, you know, a little late for that. Or someone else says, I wasn't sure... Hunch hunters were talking about what I should do concerning my future employment. I'm employed now in such and such a place, office or whatever. I seem to have this urge to go back to college and maybe enter law school or medical school. This is charismatic talking. And you know, I was out driving the other day with this on my mind and I ran out of gas. I was so caught up in 
what the Lord might want me to do, maybe enter medical school or law. I wasn't watching the gas gauge and ran out and ran out on top of the hill and coasted down and just creaked to a stop. And guess where it stopped? In front of the medical school. <laughs> now, I got a hunch I know what God wants me to do. He's telling me something. Well, if he would have followed the word of God instead of his hunches, he'd know that hunch was from the Lord because the Lord doesn't have any medical schools. Now, we know that here. I know a lot of charismatics would want to debate that. God has a school, but he doesn't have any classes and courses on law and medicine and nursing or political science. And anyway, the Holy Spirit doesn't give you hunches. He gives you an inward knowing if you learn how to listen to his voice. And he will guide you. He wants to do that. You see, God more than you, wants to tell you to walk down that aisle and not that one, for example. To make this your life's goal and not something else. So this is the one you should marry and not that one. He wants to lead you, but he can't because nobody's listening. Well, what do you feel I should do, you see? And so you can't help them if you've got the anointing. You just have to say, I don't feel a thing. But I know what you should do, and that's stop following hunches and feelings. See, people who follow hunches end up in a hole, and they can't get themselves out. But the Holy Spirit never gives a hunch. He will give you that assurance inwardly that this is right or that's wrong. I think I also, given the book God's Will, and I won't go into detail because I'm sure I do, how that when we were in Israel in 66, I had taught... Bible geography as a student in Bible class. I was a student assistant, as I said. I knew Jerusalem like the back of my hand. So one night, a brother and I, over in Israel, in old Jerusalem, walking up a certain street, I said, now over there, on the other side of the city is another gate, and I named it. I said, let's don't go back the same way. I said, let's go down that street. It was real dark to get to that gate. We'd taken a few steps and a voice came out of the darkness. Now, to this hour, I don't know whether it was an angel or anyway, it was someone used to the Lord. The voice said, you don't want to go that way. No threat, no command, but the authority, like as if an angel had spoken, was there. And I said, but, you see, I didn't know it was an angel yet or whatever. I said, but I know the way and I named the gate. So he saw I knew what I was talking about. I knew the city. I had never been there, but I knew it like the back of my hand. I could tell you where all the gates were and name them, streets and the whole thing. He said, but you don't want to go that way. You want to go back the way you came. You know, wasn't shouting, wasn't demanding, no threat. Instantly, an inward knowing. I had just received the baptism that year, by the way, and I didn't know all these things. I knew them, but suddenly I knew. I didn't say, I know I know something. But I knew I knew. Without thinking about it, I didn't even say another word. I said, let's go back this way. No protest. We were halfway back and two men stepped out of the shadows. Arabs, businessmen. Can we help you? You know, they don't do that. Opened their store, gave us Cokes, and as a result, to make a long story short, they were both saved. Now, Muslims saved. Muslims becoming Christians. I mean, that's no small thing over there because he said if even our families find out about it, they would have us killed. So you take your life in your hands. You just don't go over in Muslim country like Iran or anywhere else and start preaching on a street corner unless the Holy Spirit sent you or you're ready to be martyred. (laughs) Or either way. It is that. And the Arab Christian pastor, we got him in contact with the church there, Over in Jordan, the Jordan side, that's when you could still cross over. He said he's telling the truth. He said he'd be dead in 24 hours if they knew it. Well, the point is, we knew, at least I knew, I don't know about my partner there, but I knew to do what he said. And as a result, you see, God directed all of that. He was controlling the circumstances. But it wasn't a hunch. I got a hunch I better obey him. He might have a knife. No, it wasn't any of that. Another group, another method we should avoid are sign seekers. Feelings, followers, hunch, hunters, sign seekers. Now, God can give signs. That's one thing. But it's another thing to wait upon something unusual or supernatural before you rise up and act in faith. And there are a lot of people who won't move until they get a dream or a prophecy or a word of knowledge. They want you to give it to them sometimes. 
What does the Lord show you? Not a thing. I generally tell people, not a thing. <laughs> I'm not much help in giving advice, but I feel like I'm a lot of help and all praise to God in giving you the Word. It's where you get your advice from the Word and the Spirit within. God gives signs. Isaiah 7.14 is a sign, the virgin birth. Jonah, Jesus said, is a sign of his death, burial, and resurrection. Three days in the grave, that's a sign. Mark 16 says God gives signs to charismatics. Yeah, these signs will follow them that believe. And God went with the apostles, confirming the word with signs following. But it's another thing, you know, to seek a sign, always look for something supernatural or unusual as a means of guidance. Because you're opening yourself sometimes, maybe many times, to deception. Like the man, someone was telling me about him. Sometimes he came in and ministered where I did. And I told them, I don't think you want to have him back because he's not in line with the word. Some of the things he's teaching. I mean, it was in the area of the occult. Well, they said, we didn't know, but we thought something strange when he tells his friends, not that he teaches it openly, that he believes in reincarnation. And yet he calls himself a charismatic Christian. So the people who were telling me this said that when he was wrestling with the question of whether or not reincarnation is true, he told them, well, I prayed to the Lord to show me in some way if it's true. Now, you see, a charismatic baby ought to know better than that because you're begging for the devil to come in and delude you. You don't ask God if something that the Word of God contradicts is true or not. So instead of spending time in the Word to check out reincarnation with the Word of God, he said, I prayed, you know, the Lord would show me in some way if reincarnation is true or not. And he said, after that prayer, the next day I came down to my study and there was a book on occultism that I have on the shelf. He said, it had fallen off onto my desk and was open to the subject of reincarnation. He said, I knew that was a sign from heaven that reincarnation is true. Sign seekers often end up deluded. You don't ask God for a sign if baptism in water is true. Just read. When it says the Ethiopian eunuch went down into the water and Philip went down into the water with him and he baptized him, they both came up out of the water. You don't have to ask God, is sprinkling or pouring true or is it immersion? Well, what do you need to go into the water up to your waist to be sprinkled for? But anyway, delusion. Shortly after we received the Holy Spirit, I was teaching in our church, I think, on faith or the gifts of the Spirit. Anyway, it wasn't on 1 Timothy 4. It wasn't even related to 1 Timothy 4. But you know, it's good to follow the leading of the Spirit. Sometimes you don't know why at the moment. But in the middle of that sermon, I took off on 1 Timothy 4. In the latter days, some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and the doctrines of demons. And he goes on to say one of the doctrines of demons is forbidding the eating of meats, which is vegetarianism. You know, that error. That's a spirit. Vegetarianism is a spirit. If you don't want to eat meat, don't eat it. But we're talking about when you make a doctrine out of it. Anyway, eating meat's all right because if you read Genesis, God says he gives us the meat. And 1 Timothy 4 says, whatever you eat won't hurt you if you have faith that it won't, and thank God for it before you eat it. And a lot of good things could hurt you if you don't thank God for it and you don't have the faith. Paul said, you know, that which is not a faith is sin, and he's talking about eating meat. If you can't eat it in faith, don't eat it. Because it's sin, even to eat meat, not in faith. Well, I don't know about this bacon. That might cause my cholesterol to go up. It will and if you eat it, it's a sin, because you can't eat it in good conscience. But anyway, I took off on the air of vegetarianism. I didn't know why, and then came right back to my subject, whatever it was, gifts or faith. I don't know why I did. Didn't know at the time, after I learned why. Sitting on the back row was a vegetarian preacher. I mean, he had a book on it. He preached the doctrine of vegetarianism instead of Christ. I didn't know he was back there. And you see, the Lord was rebuking that because he was staying in the house of one of the members of our body and had influence with all the people who stayed in that house. It was a boarding house. Well, he got all upset after, just pranced up and down out on the sidewalk after the service. And the woman he was staying with was deluded by him. And she took offense too. And I think she stopped coming to church over that. 
to Faith Assembly, or to the church in Claypool. And all upset and said, well, now, I know he's all right, and the doctrine of vegetarianism is all right, because he gave me one of his books, and it was up, you know, beside my bed in the bedroom, and when I came home from that service, it was on top of the piano. Now, how did it get there except God was giving me a sign that that book's all right? Well, I could give you a dozen reasons how that book got from upstairs to downstairs. Like somebody just carried it there. Boarding house. Oh, I mean, that didn't take a lot of wisdom, did it? But looking for signs. And, of course, I would have no hang-up over through levitation got down there. If you're going to look for signs, the devil has ways. That's a whole subject in itself. Because he can work signs. And so sign seekers, like she was, was begging to be deceived. Now, people who seek signs as a means of guidance or for confirmation of something are not in line with the Word of God because the Bible forbids it. You see it, for example, in Matthew 16, to 4 where he said, A sinful and wicked generation seeks after signs. That's Jesus' opinion of sign seekers. And the devil can give you signs to confirm what you say or do. But is what you say and do in line with the Word of God? Then the sign, you see, if what you say and do doesn't line up with the Word, the sign doesn't mean anything. Occasionally people will ask me, who go by signs and visions and revelations. Now, we believe in that, you understand. But I mean, they don't know the Word or they're careless and they don't check it out with the Word. Sometimes they've asked me, but why would this come to pass? I got a vision, had a dream, prophesied, and it came to pass. Well, I said, that's very simple to answer. The Bible answers that. That there are two sources of revelation in the supernatural and visions, God and Satan. And because the thing comes to pass doesn't mean that it's from God. The only way you know the signs from God if it confirms the word, Mark 16. In fact, turn over to Deuteronomy chapter 13 for a moment. I know that we've taught on Deuteronomy 13 before. But, you know, like everything else in the Word of God, we have four Gospels that say essentially the same thing. So we're going to say the same thing again by reading Deuteronomy 13. Deuteronomy 13, that's page 318. If there arise among you a prophet, didn't say a false prophet, but just said arise among you a prophet or a dreamer of dreams, And he gives you a sign or wonder. Now look at verse 2. And the sign or the wonder comes to pass, whereof he spake unto thee. But then he says, Let us go after other gods which thou hast not known, and let us serve them. Thou shalt not hearken unto the words of that prophet or that dreamer of dreams, for the Lord your God is allowing him to prove you. Through giving you a sign, you see, that comes to pass. That's what the passage is saying. God's proving you whether or not you're going to remain loyal to God or you're going to follow signs. Oh, there are people sitting here tonight that will follow a sign if some man or woman raises up and gives it and not heed this word of warning against it. You won't do it. I've said it before. You'll do it. Some of you will do it. Wouldn't it be nice if I didn't have to say that? But from experience and from the Word of God and in my spirit, I know it's true. And they won't bother to spend time in the Word. So when the sign comes, does it confirm the Word? A sign is a sign. The Bible here, Deuteronomy, clearly says, don't follow the sign if it doesn't line up with the Word. If He gives you a sign and it comes to pass, fine. But if it doesn't line up with the Word of God, reject the sign, stay with the Word. Jesus said in Matthew 24, many will rise in the last day. Many, not some, not a few, not one or two. Many. And give you signs and wonders which could almost deceive the elect. I'm glad he said almost. If possible, it would deceive the elect. And sign seekers are asking to be deluded. All right, another group that use a method we want to avoid, we'll deal with tonight, are the circumstance coordinators. In other words, they try to get their life to fit into circumstances or circumstances into their life. Sometimes God uses circumstances to direct us. We state that in our book, How to Know God's Will, but you're not to wait on circumstances to push you one way or another. 
Don't lean on circumstances. Let circumstances help guide you. But don't lean on them. Some people lean on circumstances. 90% circumstances. 10% the word. Or less. But there's nothing wrong with circumstances if God is using them. For example, in Genesis 37... Isn't it interesting how that this Egyptian caravan comes along at the precise moment Joseph's brothers are thinking about killing him. They've got him in the pit until they can decide how to kill him. Isn't it interesting? It just came along at that precise moment. So they sold him into slavery in Egypt. You know the story. He became second ruler of Egypt during the Great Famine. Jacob and his sons went down. This is the beginning of the Hebrew nation. They're there 400 years and then they come out. But when Joseph reveals himself to his brothers, they're terror stricken thinking he's going to take revenge. He says, no, I'm not God. Do you know what he said to them? Genesis 15 verse 20, he said, you meant this for evil, but God meant it for good. So God was working in all of those circumstances all those years. God meant it for good to save much people alive. Really to create a Hebrew nation. Then we read in John 4 how that the Samaritan woman came to the well to get water. At the precise moment Jesus had decided to sit there and rest. And that's how the gospel got into Samaria. Now if you will take the time to read John chapter 4, you'll see something there. Just like Genesis 50, 20 says God was working in the circumstances. You'll see Jesus starts out that passage when they're headed toward Galilee, he says, I need to go through Samaria. He's controlling the circumstances. He already knows what he's going to do. God works in circumstances. But circumstance coordinators attempt to coordinate their life or some decision they're wrestling with with circumstances. Like a jigsaw puzzle with one or two pieces missing. They wait until all of the pieces fall into place and they say, I know what to do now. The door opened or the door closed. Well, as we said at the outset, a closed door may be God's will for you not to go. An open door may be God's will for you to enter. But on the other hand, the devil can open and close doors. Well, he knows how to do that. He knows how to turn knobs. Paul said to the Thessalonians, He said, I tried to get to you on more than one occasion, but the devil closed the door on me. That's what he says. A lot of people don't even know that's in the Bible, that the devil can close doors. So that isn't necessarily God's leading not to go because the door is closed. It may be. That's a part of it, but it may not be. But if you go only by circumstances and don't know the word and don't know how to listen to the spirit within, you won't know what to do about that door. You may misread those circumstances. And a lot of people misread them. And so people who depend upon circumstances for about 90% of their guidance often end up in the wrong place at the wrong time. Doing the wrong thing, saying the wrong thing. That's true. Well, I'm praying and the Lord hasn't opened the door yet. Well... (laughs) That closed door may only mean you're supposed to go over there and knock on it. Didn't Jesus say, knock, and it shall be open to you? You know what that implies to me? I don't even need an education to figure that one out. It means doors a lot of times are going to be closed. Or you wouldn't have said knock. Hello out there. Don't ask me what you should do. Have you knocked? Do you know the word of God? Can you hear the voice of the Spirit for yourself? You see, David would have missed God if he went only by circumstances. Circumstance coordinators wait for circumstances to push them one way or another. You know, Well, I'm waiting. Here's a piece falling into place. Uh-oh, there's another piece missing. I don't know what to do. Maybe I ought to ask. David would have missed God if he went by circumstances. He was fleeing for his life for years from King Saul. One day he and his general found old King Saul asleep in a cave. Now his general went by circumstances. He said, aha, this is God's will. He's delivered him into our hands. Let's kill him. Then you'll be free of all of your persecution. Oh, how easy it is to interpret circumstances in your favor. David said, wait a minute. I seem to be getting something else. Here it is. Touch not mine anointed. I'll take care of Saul myself, saith the Lord. He heard that voice within. There was no voice out of heaven. No first or second Samuel to read to see what he should do. He learned to listen to the Spirit. David did. He spoke with the Spirit. 
Praise God. He could hear the Spirit. We're trying to train you to hear the Spirit. I don't want you out there on the day when we face Christ to have the Lord say, Well, you got here, John Doe and Sister Mary Doe, because Brother Freeman guided you every step of the way. I don't want to hear that. I want to hear, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. You believe my word. You look to me. And you followed me by faith. Now take that for what is meant. We know what our responsibility is, is to guide you in the way. That isn't what we're saying. We're saying in the context of what we are teaching tonight. Judson would have missed God if he'd have gone by circumstances alone. He prayed and waited for years to get to India because that inward leading, he was impressed that God wanted him to preach the gospel in India, spend his life there. Finally got to go in the days of the sailing ships took a long time to get there they pulled into port they wouldn't let him off door closed to India now some of you and a lot of people I know and maybe some you know would have said I don't understand it oh who can I ask what will I do I felt impressed to come I planned my whole life to get here to preach the world's perishing millions of people in India dying Judson didn't say that. They wouldn't let him in. He just stayed on the boat, got off the next port, which happened to be Burma. That's where God wanted him all along. He spent his life there serving the Lord. See, if you go just by circumstances, if they're kind of negative, if a door's closed, sure the door was closed, but there was another one open. Now there's no one to tell you what you ought to do. You have to learn to hear the voice of the Spirit for yourself. I remember how that in college, you know, after I graduated, I knew the Lord wanted me to do graduate work. And I prayed for the Lord, you know, to show me what to do. And someone years before had given me a catalog about a certain school. And as I sought the Lord and prayed, didn't ask advice, the Lord reminded me over in my files there was a certain catalog and that's the school he wanted me to go to. To make a long story short, as a result of going to that school, I ended up teaching in the school. And as a result of teaching in the school, another teacher got baptized in the Holy Spirit and told me about it. And as a result of that, well, I could say all of you are here because at least this church wouldn't be here. And there's a case of how circumstances could confirm what I was getting in the Spirit. Because, you see, the circumstances were this, that God had somebody come along previously and give me a catalog that I wasn't even interested in. I just stuck it in the files. Generally, I was thrown it away. Because I knew what I was going to do. At least I thought I knew what the Lord wanted me to do. But see, years later, He showed me that particular catalog was where He had wanted me to go. Just like, you know, it isn't India, it's Burma. Circumstances, you see, can mislead you if you go only by those, but they can confirm, help confirm what the Spirit will show you as you seek the Lord. You see, I didn't rear back in my chair. Well, I've got a catalog. I think I'll try that. I'd forgotten about it. And so while God does work through circumstances, don't wait for them to push you one way or another. You begin to seek the Lord. You get into His Word, and then He can work in circumstances and guide you through them. That is, help guide you. But even then, it takes an act of faith. You see, all through my life, after being saved, there are ways in which, as I would pray and seek the Lord, He would show me what to do, but every time it took a step of faith on my part. You see, circumstances can't take the place of faith. I still, in every case, had to take a step of faith based upon His Word and based upon the inner leading of the Holy Spirit. If you wait for circumstances to push you in one direction or another, then you may get pushed in the wrong direction. Like the man who was on the bridge and wasn't sure whether or not he was really going to commit suicide. Wasn't sure he really wanted to until a big gust of wind came and blew him over. All the way down, well, I guess it was God's will. Splash. <laughs> That's about the way it is, people who let circumstances push them. Sometimes they push you the wrong direction. And then while we're on circumstances... The other extreme to those who go only by circumstances, wait till all the pieces fit and they say, well, that's God's will, are those who never consider circumstances. And God can't tell them a thing, can't teach them anything. 
unless he gives them a vision or a dream or sends a prophet. Because the circumstances sometimes will indicate God's trying to show you something or tell you something. So the other extreme is don't fall into the snare of not heeding circumstances. Like the woman that I read about years ago who followed visions and a voice from heaven, at least she thought it was. It was in the heaven Liz. And she said for 17 years everything was negative, financially, you know, bankrupt, physically sick. I think her husband left her everything adverse for 17 years. She finally challenged the vision and the voice and it was the devil all along. Well, if she had opened her eyes to all those adverse circumstances and the Word of God, she would have found in the Word of God that while you may go through some persecution and trial, it's not going to be 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, 365 days a year. God's going to give you a breather, even in your trials. Well, now, trials are the way into the kingdom, but these weren't trials. These were just constant adversities. So don't fall into the snare of not heeding circumstances, you see. That's the other extreme. Or... Do like those, in another case, who allow some change in their circumstances or delay to take that to mean that God is trying to get them out of that situation and move them in some other direction. Maybe a delay only means God wants you to find out why you're delayed. Not too many weeks ago, I tried to get to Fort Wayne, my day off, I believe. And I wanted to leave by nine. I had a lot to do. I couldn't get away at 9. This would come up, that would come up, the phone would ring or whatever. 9.30 was still there. I was still there at 10. If you'd have been over there, I was still there at 10.30. Still there at 11, 11.30. 12 o'clock, finally, believe it or not, I got my coat on and literally ready to go out the door. Ding dong, doorbell. Couple there who wanted to be saved. I said, praise the Lord. Now I can see why I couldn't get away till 12 because he knew you would be here at 12. So a delay, you see, doesn't mean God is trying to turn you away from something and say, don't go to Fort Wayne or change this or that, but sometimes you should find out what do these circumstances mean. And another thing to be on guard against in the matter of circumstances is apparent adverse circumstances do not necessarily mean that you're out of God's will. Any more than positive circumstances would indicate that you are. You say, it's all so very confusing. That's why you have the Holy Ghost. (laughs) Because there's no way to write a book on all the details, like people write books on dreams, how to interpret them. You can't write a book on how to interpret circumstances. All we can tell you is these things happen. Know the Word so that things will line up with it. Learn to listen to the Holy Spirit within. It'll still take a step of faith, but... If you've learned to listen to the voice of the Spirit, if you're sensitive to Him, then it's no problem stepping out by faith. You don't have to call up and say, what should I do? Because that isn't faith. Uh, Old Paul over in Thessalonica, he did get there. The devil, he said, hindered him, but he did get there because he wrote them two letters. And they just wouldn't receive the word. Oh, there was a church established there, but I'll tell you, he had a lot of enemies there. And it was so bad, we're told the saints had to sneak him out at night. So he could get away. You know, his life was in danger, as it was many times. We read he went on to Berea, the next little town, and they received the word gladly. That's where God wanted him, Berea. But if he'd gone by adverse circumstances, he could have said, well, I never saw anything like this. This is the worst persecution and opposition I've seen in years. I guess I miss God. I think I'll go back home to Palestine and pray. Because the circumstances were adverse. Would you say that? You see, you've not really had persecution yet. You've got some media jabber. Your neighbors or your families thinking you're a lunatic, religious fanatic. But would you take a beating and a stoning one time left for dead? As being out of God's will. A lot of people would. Or they would need counseling. Paul, they left him for dead. He was stoned. He just got up, you know, God raised him up. He got up and went right back into town. And we read he went right on preaching, you know, and went back and confirmed the churches that he'd established all through that area. Adverse. Another time he was arrested for his beliefs. Would that shake you up? Oh, in jail. Now that can't be God's will. How can I preach in jail? 
But the Lord appeared to him and nice said, Be of good cheer, Paul. This doesn't mean a thing. He said, You're in prison so they can get you to Rome. You're going to witness to me there. And the gospel got spread in Rome. Adverse circumstances. That doesn't mean you're out of God's will. It may mean it. That's why you need the Holy Spirit to listen to him. But it doesn't necessarily mean it any more than favorable circumstances. Prove you're in God's will. All people love to follow favorable circumstances. That means it's God's will. Not necessarily. One man, every time I would see him, I'd meet him three or four times a year. Another minister, he said, well, said I've been praying for a wife. Why is it, you know, and I can believe for everything else, but God hasn't given me a wife. Well, I said, if he wants you to have a wife and you claim of a faith, anyway, you wouldn't be asking why. It's not faith. You claim of a faith, he'll give you a wife. Then after several years, he said, well, praise the Lord. He answered my prayer. I got a wife. And she's a good one because she preaches with me. Oh, kind of a whirlwind courtship, I think, in marriage. Been praying all these years. You'd figure he got the right when the next time I saw him, oh, why did he give me one like that? That was a lemon. <laughs> Criticizes, accuses me of everything. Now she's left me, suing me for divorce and trying to get all of my goods. How much they were, I don't know, but suing him for everything. Why, why? Some of you are out there already asking why. He prayed. Isn't that what you're saying? To pray? Seek the guidance of the Lord? Listen, I want to share a little secret with you from the Holy Spirit. When you're praying about a door to open or to close, and that door looks like it's starting to open or close, that isn't the time to stop praying and jump in with both feet in deep water. That's the time really to begin to pray. Settle down now and pray to see if that's God opening the door or not. Which he didn't do. You see, Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, the message last week comes right in. Trust in the Lord with all of your heart. Lean not to your own understanding. Why, he'd been seeking a wife for years. And the first one that made goo-goo eyes. Which is an old time, <laughs> old time expression. Sometimes we date ourselves. And women have a way, some of them. He just jumped in with both feet. That's the time he should have started praying. Is this the one? Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not to your own understanding. In all your ways, look to Him, and He will direct your path, whether it's to the altar or not, whatever. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Now, of the three basic ways that we've dealt with, stress, to seek the mind or will of the Lord through the Word, the leading of the Holy Spirit, circumstances, this is as important as anything we'll say tonight. Of the three, circumstances ought to have the least influence upon you and your decisions. Why? It's so easy to misread circumstances. So easy. And because human nature being what it is, people want to follow the favorable circumstances and say, that's God. Or look upon the unfavorable circumstances, that's not God. It's very easy to say, well, everything just seemed to be falling into place like a jigsaw puzzle. And the door opened. Now, why am I caught in this snare? It's so easy to say, everything was going wrong. The door closed. It couldn't have been God's will. It's so easy. The door closed. That wasn't God. Well, you know, the four men I read in Mark 2 who carried the man sick of palsy came to have Jesus healed him, met a closed door. That didn't stop them. They made one. They just made their own in the roof. Sometimes a closed door, that's why you need the leading of the Spirit to know, a closed door only means that you are to make you one or knock. We've already said, Jesus said, knock and it shall be opened to you, which implies that some doors will be closed and you've got to knock. So you can't go by a closed door. Sometimes a closed door just says, now wait a minute, pray. See what the mind of the Lord is. The Lord may say, go knock on that door. He may be saying, I'm closing that door. But circumstances are not to determine your decision. Because it's closed, because it's open, that doesn't mean a thing. The devil can open and close doors. And does all the time. Sometimes a closed door means that you are to do something about it or do nothing about it. We could spend a lot of time giving examples, but maybe one would suffice. When I graduated from college... I knew that the Lord wanted me to go to the seminary, graduate school, because I knew what he wanted me to do, earn the highest degree and teach. I didn't know how it would end up, but I knew that. So I confessed it. Confessed it, you know, all along. 
after my first year in college. I confessed doctor's degree. That's way out in graduate school. That's three degrees later, four degrees later. But when I graduated from college, I went to the city where the seminary was. I couldn't find work, couldn't find a place to stay, had no money, had nothing but my faith. So the day that you matriculate, register, I said to my wife, I'll get in my car. I'll go up there tonight. I'll go the day before, go up there and sleep in the car and then start registering like I've got a job, a house, because they know no one is foolish enough to enter a graduate school that doesn't have some financial support. They know no one would do that, so they're not going to ask me. So I, I was doing that, and in the line, signing up for courses, tap on the shoulder, are you looking for a job? You see, the Lord has his people. He says, certain place, they're hiring house parents. You might want to go investigate. Guess what I did? I went and knocked on the door. Knock, knock, come in. You meet the bill. I mean, you and your wife are perfect for the job. The Lord all the way. I didn't sit back and say, this is going to be all God. This has got to be faith. I don't want to be guilty of forcing a door open that's closed. I want this to be God. I'm not going to do a thing. He knows my needs. Let him open it. And then I'll know it's God. No, he says sometimes you have to knock. And you know, I had been trained in accounting. I'd been supervisor during the war of accounting department. I could keep books. Now I have a college education. I can do a lot of things. Mainly teach the Bible. Because that was my major. And so I could have rationalized, well, I'll wait for God to open one of these big jobs. You know what I got a job being? A daddy. (laughs) And she a mama to teenage delinquents. Last thing in the world you'd pick. Last thing I would pick. (laughs) Because I got an education there, believe it or not. But anyway, I knocked. Everything was closed. But I was acting my faith. I was doing what I could do. No one is going to ask me, do you have a job and a place to stay? And how are you going to support your family? They know that you've got that or you wouldn't be entering. I didn't have any of it. But when something seemed to open, I went and knocked. And that was it. Now, that doesn't mean, as we've said, that you should try to force a door open that's closed and call it faith. No, you need to wait for the leading of the Spirit. You need to be so sensitive to Him that when something like that comes up, you can go knock and believe you're in God's will. Whether or not the door will close finally, you don't know yet. You're moving by faith, but you have to be sensitive to His voice. Now... So there won't be any confusion if a door opens and every factor in the situation seems to be right. That's probably God. You see, circumstances don't have to confuse you. We're not talking about now following circumstances. But if everything is right and you have the inward witness that's right and you know the word of God. And then if a door closes and you're praying about it and everything is wrong about it. Don't try to force your way through and call it faith. Just back up and wait and pray. Because that may be God saying, I don't want you there. See, that doesn't mean he's not leading you. That is his leading, maybe. Generally, that's his leading if the door closes and everything else looks that way. So this is why it's so important to know when the Spirit of God is in the situation, what he's telling you to do. And no one can teach you how to hear the voice of the Spirit for yourself. It's in our book, Deeper Life in the Spirit, what The Holy Spirit does in his leading, but you have to train yourself, just like in learning code or anything else you want to do. You've got to spend the time with the Spirit of God. It isn't trial and error so much. It's just getting out of the way so he can speak. And people can miss God, we're saying, if they just go by the circumstances and not what the Scriptures say or what the Spirit of God might be trying to say to them, and they're not listening. For example, if a minister is impressed or feels led that he should leave a certain church and God wants him somewhere else and he may not know where yet. And I've left meetings many times because I knew the Lord said it's time to go and some of you have. You knew it was time to go. But if a minister is impressed he should leave a certain area, then he begins to pray about it, seek the mind of the Lord and He goes out to have a meal with a friend and they discuss this because the friend is interested in him being in the will of God. 
And in the conversation, the friend happens to mention he's leaving tomorrow for a vacation in Florida. You know, just a passing remark. Then after two Big Macs and a malt and large Coke with fries, he goes home. And during the night, he has a dream that he's on a plane going south. The next day after that dream, he goes to the restaurant, as his custom is, to have his breakfast. And they serve him Florida orange juice. And if he takes all of that to mean, oh, I have a hunch God wants me to go to Florida to minister. You see, that may sound good to him, especially if there are three or four feet of snow in Indiana at the time. That may sound good, but, you know, in all probability, that isn't the guidance the Spirit is trying to give him. If you go by circumstances, see, everything will just fit into place. The devil will see to that. Sometimes, you know, it's just a lot of baloney. Sometimes it doesn't mean a thing. All of those circumstances just fit so neatly in place. And the dreams. And I had my eyes closed and it seemed like I had a vision. And I saw, and I could hear the breakers rolling in. Everything looked so favorable, you see, because Florida is a good place to live. I used to. I mean, in wintertime especially. People who follow circumstances generally end up deluded. Because, you see, the devil can manipulate that area of the natural realm and just make everything look so rosy or so negative that you'll miss God. 